Welcome to the Social Workers Radio Talk Show, where we'll be having a special segment, Social Work Shorts, which is a brief interview with a guest on an important social work topic. Unlike our live, longer shows, this segment is pre-recorded and will only be about 15 minutes, but packed with content. Today we have Cheryl Kaplan with us. Ms. Kaplan is a licensed social worker and a, a credentialed prevention professional with over 30 years of experience providing individual, family, and group counseling for children, adolescents, and adults. Ms. Kaplan was a school social worker employed by Capital Region BOCES for more than 26 years. During that time, she worked as a student assistant counselor for prevention program provider in elementary, middle, and high schools across the Capital District. Ms. Kaplan specializes in the application of brain-based research for social work and related professionals. In particular, she provides trainings on the impacts of poverty, trauma, and addiction on the developing brains of children. She also instructs about how schools, families, and communities can help address the resulting challenges. So that's quite a packed description of what you do. So I'd like to jump jump on in and just say welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be back here. Uh, you are an alum. Yeah, you are I, a social work alum. I got my MSW 30 years ago, 1986. So it's very neat to be back here. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just really fascinating, so I want to jump right in because we don't have too much time, but I'm curious, how and why did you become interested in the brain? Uh, probably maybe about six or seven years ago, I found that whatever kind of conference or training I went to, whether it was on eating disorders, um, special education, family therapy, everything kept coming back to the brain. And I found it fascinating. I started um, buying books, going to trainings, watching videos, and there has been so much that has been learned in the past 10, 20 years about the brain, and I just found it fascinating. And it became a hobby, and I was very lucky in that I was able to kind of use the information in the work I was doing. And it um, is wonderful to be able to talk about something so exciting. Now, the brain, I mean, we're all born, and the brain changes over time. And can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. And what is really fascinating is people always used to believe that, okay, once you're 10 or 15, your brain, it's done. You can't do anything to change it. They now know that your brain is, and they call it neuroplastic. Neuroplasticity is the word. But what it means is you can change your brain. And you can do it right through your 90s. And they now know that every time you learn something, just talking, you're changing your brain. It's being rewired. And I will always, you know, I'll say to social workers and teachers a lot, you may not realize it, but you really are neurosurgeons. You're changing brains. You may not be getting paid as if you're a neurosurgeon. But everything you do, you're helping people change their brains. Well, they're even saying now, I saw a lot of articles and research that would older individuals to do activities to stimulate the brain and to, you know, which helps with maybe dementia or exactly. to prevent dementia or yes, delay dementia. Exactly. They are realized more and more what you do early in life can really, it's proactive for your brain. But the exciting thing is even somebody in their 70s or 80s it's never too late. There are all kinds of activities. And the things that probably are best for your brain are things that people do all the time. Exercise, um, social engagement, all of these things. And they now know. And the reason they know so much is in the 90s. They actually called it the decade of the brain, of brain science, because they developed imaging techniques, something called an fMRI, so they can actually see inside the brains of people while they're alive, which is, you know, and doing things, which is why we now know about babies' brains, the teenager brain. In fact, believe it or not, I was reading something that now they can even look in the brains of pets, like dogs, to see what's going on in their brains. That's amazing. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. But when we think about brains, there's it can be impacted sometime in a, a negative way, I guess. Yes. So um, as a former school social worker, I... I loved being in the schools, but I also <laughs> saw that there were students sometimes who were 
in have po- you know in poverty there was yes. trauma there yeah. were just things that were going on in life that were affecting them so why is it important for schools to understand how pom- poverty trauma and stress affect the brains of their students and what can they do about it okay and you know what is such a wonderful thing is schools more and more schools are beginning to realize that when their students come to school they bring with them everything going on in their lives and they now know that when people and especially children experience toxic stress, poverty, trauma, it actually physically changes their brain. Um, Because when people are you know in chronic stress or trauma they actually produce extra cortisol which they now know kills brain cells and it can make it harder to learn, it can make it harder to focus in school But what they now know, this is the positive thing, and I always want to make sure that people realize that what is so hopeful is that people, and you can even change, um, you can teach little kids to change their brains about what they can do to calm down. Because schools now realize if kids can't focus in school if they are dealing with trauma, poverty, and all these other things in their lives, when they come to school, they're not going to be able to learn. They're not going to be able to remember things. So schools are beginning more and more to do a lot of what social-emotional learning. Um, even, and I'm happy to say, you can even say the word now, mindfulness. I know many, many schools in the area that are teaching their kids mindfulness techniques, ways to be able to calm themselves down, to self-regulate, And it's so empowering when people realize, maybe I can't change my environment on the outside, but I can change inside how I feel. And it's a plus because usually that's something that happened when the kids went to the social worker's office. Yes. Whereas now it's incorporated into the the classroom. Yes. Which is a great way to reach all kids, not just the kids identified to go to a social worker. You're reaching the entire class. But Kids are dealing with a lot today. Exactly. And I think, and it's not just kids even, I think the staff, the adults, more and more um, adults are dealing with so many stresses and realizing these are techniques they need to use, especially if you're working in a school, in your own life. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to raise awareness about the brain. Yes. Um, And you do a lot of different trainings. Um, You have done trainings for schools, other agencies, and the titles include Poverty in the Brain, The Impact of Trauma in the Brain, The Teen Brain, Addiction in the Brain, and many more. And they sound so interesting. It's great that you're sharing your expertise, but how are schools using this information to help their students and staff? Are these agencies, what are they doing with the information? You come in for a training, you give mm-hmm. them the information. You talked about some schools already using mindfulness. Yeah. Is there other things that your trainings, you're sort of giving this information, what are they doing with it? Well, I think it's probably the most important thing is just changing the mindset. And, and realizing so often when kids are acting out or we may label it as bad behavior, we may label a lot of things as even mental health issues, whereas they're just natural reactions to either the trauma in their life or maybe just some of the stresses. So to realize if you can help kids to learn how to self-regulate, then they will do better at school. So I think it's really opening the eyes of staff. Um, I know there is something called trauma-informed care. People may have heard of it. It's a whole new approach they're using in schools, hospitals, juvenile justice system. And the whole idea is when you are looking at a behavior or a person, it's not so much about what the behavior is, why are you doing that. It's looking at what happened to you. What happened in your life? Why are you acting this way? And I think if teachers realize when a student is acting out, there's more to the story. And rather than just right away disciplining or assuming you know what's going on, to really remember why is this student acting this way? There must be a reason. 
So it's why is it so valuable for people of all ages to learn about their own brains? I mean, when we think about where we talked a lot about schools and how teachers need to be aware for their students to know why they're acting this way. Mm -hmm. But for all adults, I mean, someone in their 20s, someone in their 50s, someone in their 90s, why is it important for us sort of to know about our own brain? Because, well, we actually carry our brain with us all of the time. And I think um, it's so important because... A lot of times people don't realize when if they want to make changes, they think, oh, I'm just a negative person or, oh, I have this bad habit, I can't change it. But as people begin to become educated and you're never too young to learn about it, you start to realize it's almost like if you're going to work out with weights for your body. When you can do things, different activities, different exercises with your brain, you can grow your brain. You, they now know that there is something, I'm going to say another N-word, neurogenesis. And what that means is you can grow new brain cells. And the way you do that, um, one of the top ways is with exercise. When people exercise, they are producing a chemical that they actually give it the well, it actually stands for a big word, BDNF, that, which means something, but they call it miracle grow for the brain. That even things like exercise can help people to be more, um, you know, they'll remember things better, they'll learn better, they'll feel better. And just like with physical exercise, sometimes it takes time. You don't see results right away, so sometimes... People might try an activity for their brain, right. a brain exercise, and say, oh, it didn't work. Yes. Whereas it's, just like with if you're mm -hmm. trying to lose weight or trying to build exactly. muscle, all of those things take time, and it's yep. the effect over time and continuing to do it and practice and push yourself. Exactly. You can't do the same activity, yes. I'm guessing, to stimulate the brain. It has to keep challenging yourself. As you reach one level, you move to the next. Just like as exercise, mm -hmm. you continue to push yourself to the next level. And then you are going exactly. to start to see results. Exactly. And I think something very interesting is they say our brains are still wired as in prehistoric days. We're still wired as if we were cavemen. And there is somebody, um, an author, who talks a lot about this. And I love what he, he says. Our brains are Teflon for positive and Velcro for negative. We are wired, we're still wired, that negative affects us much, you know, it's much stronger. So it's so important that you work hard to try to have, say positives, give positives, and do positive things, and focus on positive, because it does change your brain. I mean, this has been fascinating, and we're just about out of time, but I'd like to, where can people go for more information, or if they want to find out about your trainings, or if they're an agency and they want to maybe have you um, give a training, where can they find you? I actually um, recently retired, and, and I'm now able to just devote my time to doing trainings, and um, I'm going to give you my email, because that would probably be the best way to contact me. It's Cheryl, S H. E R Y L dot Kaplan, which is K A P L A N for the numeral four at gmail dot com. Okay, that is great because I, it's, it's really interesting and. I'd like to find out more information, so I'm sure some of the people listening would as well. So I just want to thank you again for being on, giving us information about the brain and how so many different things, especially trauma, poverty, all of those things impact the brain, and some sort of tips and tools as to what we can do to help our brain grow and help our brain, I guess, heal in mm -hmm. a sense. Of Definitely. How do yes. we, you know, how do we add those positives if there is trauma, if there is things going on in our mm -hmm. lives? How do we help our brain? To, to grow and to, to move forward and exercise it to get to that level where we want it to be. There's a lot of things that people may not realize they're probably already doing but can do even more of. So I'd like to thank you again. I get, this is uh, Cheryl Kaplan uh, with us. She's a licensed clinical social worker, a credentialed prevention professional, and she has over 30 years of experience. And today you listened to her speak about the brain and the impact of poverty, trauma, and addiction on the brain.